on this episode of Finding Beautiful Strangers. He couldn't come to terms with the creative vision of the producer. I mean, he said, Abby, I don't need you anymore. You got me the producer. I'm good. And I said, what do you mean you're good? I did all this work with you for all these years. You don't get this. Finding Beautiful Strangers is my adventure as a serial entrepreneur and how the people I meet along the way make it possible. It's not a job. It's a lifestyle. I'm Abby Wallach, and it's my story. Okay, back to Kermit Love. So Kermit and I became super close. He was a brilliant man who was very strict, who had lots to share, who would tell me what to do all the time, and really taught me the ins and the outs of Hollywood. And we would talk for hours. He brought me into his world of puppets. He shared his scripts with me, his his projects. And I really embraced his brilliance and his personality and his love of what he did and his knowledge. And he had this fantastic studio on Great Jones Street, and we would meet there and we would brainstorm. And he brought me into his magical world of puppetry and the characters that he built and created and became legends that we've all grown up with. So that was a huge opportunity. We worked together for many years. And what happened along the way was I learned so much about the entertainment business. And then with Kermit as my mentor, you know, that was a whole other world of Hollywood and film and theater and television that I learned about. And one of the challenges, though, that I did have with Kermit We actually had a huge fight. And from there, my next mentor, who was another fabulous person, was Gladys Niederlander, who I worked on a movie set with. She was had her own production company. It's called Niederlander Television and Film. We met in the bathroom at MTV pitching. I was there pitching some shows, and I was still working with Kermit at the time. But I told her I was going out to L.A., and she said, show up in my office, darling. You can be my executive producer out there. I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. But at the time, I was still working with Kermit on multiple projects. So I was told her all about that. And I was going to take these projects with me to Hollywood. And now I was an executive producer for Nederlander TV and Film. How lucky am I? Now, this was totally a moment that I embraced because I literally went from rock and roll, production, hardcore promotional tours to corporate executive, Showtime Networks, big job, great job, learned that business, took it all in, celebrity, talent, finding my Kermit, who became my mentor, and then finding this woman in the bathroom who I worked on a movie set with. But the point is, these were all opportunities that were presented to me that every single time a door opened, I walked through. There wasn't a, an opportunity that I did not take. Well, actually, one. When I created that cooking show, I somehow weaseled my way into the CEO's office of the Food Network. His name was Reese Schoenfeld. Now, Reese Schoenfeld was the CEO of CNN. And he knew how to build a new network and a new basic cable network. And I was, like, fascinated by that. And he really liked me. And he said, quit your job at Showtime. Come work for me. You'll run around and get coffee. And we're just starting. And I looked at him and I said, can't you just buy my show? He said, no, I can't do that. We can't have a food show where we have kids and it's a liability and on and on and on. P.S. I didn't take the job. I appreciated his help. And I went back to my job at Showtime and then off to the Nederlanders. But what I learned in that moment was you never know, because if I look back and I think, well, what if I took that job at the Food Network? It was the week that it started. Maybe I could have been the president of the network. That was a dream of mine. I wanted to be the president of the network. But I didn't take that shot. And now I'm hustling. I am the full-time hustler as an executive producer for the Nederlanders. is a very unique opportunity where I'm living in Newport Beach with my husband, who's doing a plastic surgery training. I have one kid. 
Nederlander TV and film. I got major books in my backpack that I'm schlepping to Paramount and wherever I'm going in Hollywood, I'm meeting with the agents, the producers, the writers, I'm pitching, I'm packaging, I'm learning the ropes. And I am calling her every single night. And she's a socialite in New York, you know. They are the Nederlanders of Nederlander fame, and they own every theater. And every night she's out at a soiree or a show on Broadway, and I'm literally slugging it out in Hollywood, driving two hours to get to the studios because I live in Laguna Beach and dropping my kid off at a nanny. And I'm like, I've arrived. I am not going to pass on this moment. So I hightail it up there every single day for the months that we live in L.A. And I literally call Gladdy every night. And I can to this day hear Bob saying, Gladdy, Abby's on the phone. Pick up line one. And I have to say, when I think about Gladdy, she was just a firecracker. She was so hot to trot. She was super smart. She had passion. She was winning the Cable Ace Awards. And she produced some really great movies. And what I love the most about her is that she let me be her in Hollywood, use her name and her production company. And she trusted me to be her voice out there as she was older and really play the game and learn how to do it and be in Hollywood as an executive producer and walk the walk and find projects and learn how to pitch and learn how to package. And it was really an amazing experience. Gladdy, like Kermit, was looking for someone young who was tenacious and ambitious and would hit the pavement, right? Like I was just that girl. Like I got this cool gig and I hit the pavement and I just opened doors and no one did it for me. They just allowed me to leverage their names, their celebrity, so to speak, and their projects. And I'll never, ever forget this moment Gladdy and Bob, her husband, who was really a wonderful man and inspiration for me as well, he said to me, Abby, your name should be Up in Lights. And I looked at him and I'm like, you know, Up in Lights for what? I'm like, yeah, I'm a producer. And Gladdy allowed me to learn from her. What Gladdy really did for me was gave me the platform. She taught me the ins and the outs, right, the relationships, how to work with the agents, how to work with the writers, how to package and pitch. You know, back in those days, it was about a Rolodex. I don't know if anyone remembers a Rolodex, but it was a little thing on your desk that you would just roll around and every contact you ever had was in there. So to be able to head out to Hollywood and just pick up the phone. There was this book. It was a creative directory. And everybody in the business was in this book. And I would literally be like, hi, I'm Abby Wallach. I'm the executive producer for Nederlander TV and film. And those doors would fly open. No one would say no in La La Land. Actually, no one ever says no in Hollywood. That's how it works. You pitch your heart out, you package celebrity, the fancy, this, that. No one ever says no, and you're left hanging forever. In New York, that's a different story. They didn't return your phone calls. Industries on both sides of the coast were very different. And what I learned from Gladdy was how to work that circuit like nobody's business and how to drive it home and how to make deals and how to advocate and how to get out there and just make shit happen. And it was a great time and I loved every minute of it. Kermit was a huge, huge, larger-than-life personality and a very big inspiration for me. When we were together, he would always tell me to stand up straight, wear heels, project forward. But the other thing that he would say to me on a regular basis was, Abby, when you start climbing that mountain, you just keep climbing and never, ever look down. You just keep looking up and you keep climbing. And that's what you do. The fact that Kermit, with his hands literally built Big Bird and Snuffleupagus, was larger than life. I mean, this was a man of not only great talent, but of great vision and great ideas. And I guess he saw something in me or allowed, maybe because I was such a pain in the ass and I called him all the time. That's just kind of how I operate. But he was definitely fascinated with my ambition and my vision and my drive and my tenacity and my energy. 
And he also, at this late stage in his career and his life, he never stopped working. Most true creatives never stop working. He still had things in him to sell. And I was like his young voice. I was the girl who was willing to get out there and sell his ideas for free because we had a deal in writing, as my grandmother always said, get it in writing. But he would always power me up with material. We had our movie scripts. We had our TV shows. We had had so many things to work with. And I would just hit the Hollywood offices and I'd go out and do my thing. But where Kermit and the one time, and he became very close to my family, he knew my children, he knew Stephen, my husband, we had a falling out. And that falling out happened when I finally, finally, finally got a deal. And what it takes to get a deal is like freaking arduous, okay? It's a hard row to tow. But I finally got us a deal, and it was for the Nutcracker Ballet with his puppets. And I brought this brilliant producer to the table from my years at Showtime. And I was making the deal, and I was getting a contract. And at this point, Kermit was so difficult. And he couldn't come to terms with the creative vision of the producer. And then he did this, and it was very hurtful to me at the time. He said, Abby, I don't need you anymore. You got me the producer. I'm good. And I said, what do you mean you're good? I did all this work with you for all these years. You don't get this. This is, I want to be a producer. He was like, no, I think you're okay. You brought me the deal. You were, that's the job. Let's play this out like it's forever, ever, ever, yeah. You and me together, yeah. There ain't nothing better, yeah. I flipped a shit like nothing else. I was hysterical, crying, how dare you? I was not only hurt, I was mortified. I spent all these years, all this time, all of my dedication to promoting. See, I, Abby, am the ultimate promoter. And I don't promote because it's a job. I promote from my heart. I promote because I care. I promote because I believe in something or I believe in someone. And I believed in him. I believed in his genius. I believed in his vision, his ideas, and the projects that we worked on together. So in the end, I was very hurt. He did meet me in the country. He's no longer alive. And we did make up and we did move forward. But I explained my feelings, that I had worked so hard, that this was my moment too, not just him. Because I wasn't just an agent. I was a creative with him. But I was very hurt at that time. But we did make up in the end. And whenever I see Big Bird and Snuffy and all of those larger-in-life legends... I think very fondly of him and who he was and the effect that he had on my life and my career. My Gladys and Kermit years were experiences that I really created. And I opened doors that I just walked through. And I don't know if I knew what I was doing at the time. I'm sure I did because everything I did had a mission or a reason. But when I look back, I think I was really blessed to have these brilliant people who allowed me to do my thing. And they trusted me. And I loved every single minute of it. And it taught me a lot. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. So I think that when I really look back about my early career, I wanted to be at the top, and I was willing to do whatever it took. And I attribute a lot of that to my early childhood and my family and wanting to be successful, right, on my own, on my own merit, that I could do anything. But I think because of the way I grew up in my family's legacy and the businesses that I was around, I was privy to things that made me feel a certain way. And I think in those jobs that I had, they kind of didn't know what to do with me and they wanted to put me in a box. And I wouldn't allow that. I didn't want to be, well, I didn't want to be told what to do. I did what I was told and I listened and I learned. And I have to say, I had great bosses that I learned a lot from. I always listened. I learned how to write. I learned how to edit. I learned how to produce. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't learn from the people above me. So I am very grateful to those people and to my colleagues. But there was something about me that I didn't know how to play the politics and I didn't know how to play the rules. I just kind of did my thing my way. And I do attribute that 
a lot to my upbringing, to my mom who really let me be me and let me be authentic and fun and playful and visionary and pursue my dreams and just do, you know, she was actually very strict. I wasn't allowed to do a lot of things like go to Studio 54 at 15, and but I did anyway. But the thing is that in the corporate world, no matter how hard I worked and driven and tenacious I was and whatever doors I got in, maybe my personality was just too big and maybe I was too much. No one ever actually told me, but I was with a very close friend of mine who I admire, I adore, very successful. And I said, would you have fired me if uh, I worked for you? And she looked me straight in the eye. She said, probably. And I was like, wow, thanks. And You know, maybe I need to go back to her to find out why she would have fired me now. But I'm just, you know, one of those people. I operate how I operate, and I feel good about who I am in my life, and I'm appreciative, and I just do my thing. And I never give up. Coming up in the next episode, an elevator encounter leads to a 17-year partnership, and style stalking inspires an idea ahead of its time, setting the stage for the OG of influence, from the street to the screen to the store. Don't be a stranger. Find me at abby.wallach on Instagram. And if you want to learn more about my projects and the things that I've done, check it out, abbywallach.com. This podcast is produced and edited by Mark Rako. Copyright 2022, Abby Wallach Productions. <laughs> <laughs>